Communism in Central and Eastern Europe, the Romanian uh, Revolution, uh, going into the jungles of Bolivia with the DEA for an undercover operation, uh, the Lebanon War, the First Intifada, uh, Sandy Hook uh, Elementary School uh, shootings, the 75th anniversary of the liberation of, of Auschwitz, all the way to uh, covering the barber coat that Queen Elizabeth wears and how those coats are made to the, uh, the guy that does the, he's the master upholsterer of Colonial Williamsburg. She was honored as a Lifetime Achievement Award for the News Women's Club of New York. She last year was inducted into the Women's Hall of Fame uh, for the Michigan Women Forward. And the thing that, that I get out of Martha watching watching Martha and, and her reporting and her writing is she has this ability to draw you in with the way she writes, the way she talks, um, like you're hearing a story from an old friend. And her book, um, When Harry Met uh, when Minnie. Harry met Minnie, yes, yes. When Harry met Minnie is exactly the same way. Uh, when you read it, you can hear Martha's voice. Uh, and I'm so pleased to have her here today. And then there is no better person, I think, to, to uh, be in conversation with her than former CNN Vice President Gail Evans. Gail is an author. She is a lecturer. She's a veteran of the uh, Johnson administration and, and so, so much more. Um, you'll get a chance to ask Martha questions. You'll look at the bottom of your screen. There's a QA and a uh, section. You can put uh, your questions in there and we'll get to them just after we hear a little bit from Gail Evans and Martha Teichner. Ladies, welcome. Thank you, Tony. Thank Wonderful you. to be here. Martha, great to have you here. Welcome back to Atlanta. Thank you. Well, I'm not exactly in Atlanta. <laughs> I'm sort of um, peering at Atlanta through Zoom. <laughs> right, right. So this is your first book. I thought that was so interesting because a, a lot of reporters write a lot of books. I mean, and this was the first one you chose. So why was this the book? Well, it's my story. Um, when I cover stories for CBS News, whether it's, you know, the war stories or, or, or um, uh, cultural stories, um, that is, it, it's, I'm involved in it, but that's, it, it's not my personal life. It's not my personal story. And uh, they always tell you uh, when you're uh, taking writing classes and so on and so forth, write what you know. Uh, and this is something I lived and something I know. And um, it was very, very, very important to me and very um, intensely meaningful to me as it was happening. And so uh, I felt that this was an appropriate story to tell. So when Harry met Minnie, tell us the connection between Harry and Sally and Harry and Minnie. Well, they're love stories. It, it, Harry, uh, this Harry, uh, happened to be a bull terrier and Minnie was a bull terrier and um, they're love stories. And every time I tell people about um, uh, the what happened between the dogs and the whole set of circumstances uh, around adopting Harry, um, people would say, and when they found out I was gonna write a book, they'd say, well, you've got to call it When Harry Met Minnie um, because it, it, it just seemed obvious. And again, it's a love story and uh, um, they loved each other in ways that you could see. I mean, you could, you, it, one would not necessarily know that dogs loved each other like, like, like um, a boyfriend and girlfriend or a couple, but they did. They were just so sweet. And they, they became devoted to one another in ways that were very obvious. So it's interesting. It's a love story and it's a tragedy. I, I don't entirely see it as a tragedy. I mean, yes, it's tragic that Carol Fertig, the person who owned 
Harry and was desperately searching for a place for someone who would take him. Nobody seemed to want him. Um, she was dying of liver cancer and uh, was more concerned about finding a home for Harry than she was about her own impending death. But um, the thing about it was that as sad as parts of this story were, um, um, it in the long run, to me, wasn't sad because uh, Carol found a solution to the problem of what was going to happen to Harry, which meant that she could die feeling um, content because she didn't have to have her dog put down. The, the, the creature that she loved more than anything. I was happy because not only did I find a companion for Minnie who had been pining for the dog I had had before who had died, um, but I was part of a circle of friends of Carol's um, who were a support group, who were a self-designated family and everything about those relationships, that, that closeness, that, that, um, that love among a group of people, um, that to me wasn't a tragedy. Um, there was happiness, there was humor, there was um, joy, the, there was um, excitement. Um, so it wasn't really entirely a tragedy. Yes, it was a tragedy, Carol died, but the rest of it wasn't a tragedy. So beautiful, you know, people think of New Yorkers as unfriendly and they think of New York as this anonymous place. Uh, but this is a story that to me, uh, and it was interesting because I saw your piece on CBS Sunday morning before Tony asked me to do the interview. And I said, oh, I know because I saw, uh, I loved the piece when I saw it, but it, it felt to me like New York as a small town, not as this anonymous unfriendly. So share with us a little of the coincidence of the beginning of all the, this, the, the finding of the unexpected, I guess, and how New York really is a small town. New York is definitely a small town. It's a, it's a whole conglomeration of little villages, if you will, um, of, of small communities. And uh, a lot of them are, are, I think, based on people's neighborhoods and also their affinities. For me, one of the most wonderful things about living in New York is the uh, fact that the Union Square Farmer's Market is wonderful and uh, in and of itself. And uh, I go to the Union Square Farmer's Market early in the morning, every week, unless the weather is so bad that I just can't bring myself to walking the mile and a half each way. And um, usually I, I take my dogs and um, uh, it happened that um, on the morning that all of this began, um, I got Minnie to come with me and she hadn't been for a long time going with me because she was just so despondent and lethargic after my previous um, uh, second dog died, Goose, um, that she was, um, she just didn't wanna do anything. And I finally got her to go with me and we went to the farmer's market and we were standing around um, talking to the acquaintances I see at the farmer's market every single week. It happened to be that I was talking to a couple who had another bull terrier um, named Sonny. And we were standing at the northeast corner of the farmer's market. And I looked up and there I saw a guy that I had known dog walking along the Hudson River, which of course is on the opposite side of Manhattan, near where I live, um, on the west side of Manhattan and Union Square is sort of nearly east. And um, I'd never seen this guy at the farmer's market ever. And I'd been going for more than 20 years, practically every Saturday. And I hadn't seen him at all for a year or two because he'd moved to another part of the city and I wasn't seeing him every single morning walking his golden retriever along the Hudson River as I was walking my bull terriers. And I looked at him and he looked at me and he came over and he pointed at Minnie and said, well, where's Goose? And I told him that Goose had died and that I had been trying to find 
an older male bull terrier to adopt to make her happy again and that I'd failed. And he whipped out his phone and um, showed me a picture that he pulled up. And he said, remember, I, I um, told you about my friend Carol who had who has a bull terrier. Um, and remember, I took this picture of Minnie and Goose at Hudson River Park um, to send to her. And frankly, I didn't really remember it. And sort of slowly, the whole story started coming back. And um, uh, he said, well, she's dying of liver cancer. Nobody wants her dog, Harry. He's 11 and a half. He's got some health issues, um, both physical and um, behavioral, but he's really a sweet dog. Uh, she's more worried about herself or about Harry than she is about herself. Would you take him? You know, I was just sort of ah, um, all of this talk about trying to find a companion for Minnie. And then all of a sudden, here's a reality. And I thought, oh, you know, I could sort of cringe and back off and and um uh i didn't i just sort of coming out of me bubbling out of me i said well yes if they get along and at that point i kept thinking it would be easy to say no but it just sort of bubbled up out of me and that set in motion everything that happened in the book all the 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 dating if you will and making friends with carol and with stephen miller siegel who was the guy who 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 i was having this conversation with um i knew his dog's name was teddy he knew my dogs were goose and minnie but we had to introduce each other because in new york people tend to know the dog's names without knowing the people's names when you have dog walking acquaintances the big thing is that if I hadn't been standing exactly where I was, and if he hadn't been exactly where he was at that moment, none of it would have happened. It was one of those incredible serendipity moments that, that um, you just can't quite believe are not somehow preordained because I had never seen him there before ever. And he, you know, had moved away. So, how did it happen that right then and there, this 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 um, kismet occurred? Yeah. So I mean, so often, I mean, coincidence. Who knows what's magical, you know, or 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 not with all of it. So it's very interesting. As I'm talking to you, my 14 year old golden retriever is sitting at my side, wanting to be um, petted. And like Stephen, I'm a golden retriever person. You're a bull terrier person. And it's fascinating since I read the book, the number of people I have seen on dog walks with bull terriers. Really? Huh. Yes, right. I, I recommended your book to two different <laughs> families with bull terriers in Piedmont Park. Uh, but my, my real question for you is, they're very different. Golden Retrievers are one kind of dog. Tell everybody about bull terriers because I really didn't know that much before I started reading. Well, first of all, they're funny looking. Um, they have these sort of egg-shaped heads and um, little slitty eyes. And um, they're comical. They're stubborn. They're incredibly stubborn. They're devious. They're too smart for their own good. They're tricky. Um, if they don't have enough to do, if, you, if they get bored, they get in trouble. They're subversive. Um, they're very loving and they know they're funny and they're comedians and they act up so that, that you'll laugh at them. And um, they, they realize that they're comedians. And, and again, if they, if they uh, don't get the attention that they want or if they get bored, they look for ways to cause trouble. And I think that's why I like them. <laughs> Interesting. So I have a very personal question. I have a, I have a friend who's actually a television producer who posted about four or five months ago on Facebook, when you leave the house, do you say to your dog, I'll be back soon? And are you careful about whether you, you know, if you're not gonna be back soon, that you just say, I'll be back or, or goodbye. And I'm curious, when you leave the house, do you talk to your dogs and do you give them accurate information? Well, what I do is that um, I've had bull terriers that are, white and I've had bull terriers that are black and white and so on and so forth. And 
the white ones are better for this, but Harry had a big white stripe down his face. I give them big red lipstick kisses and I tell them I love them. Oh, okay. I'll say, I'll be back. And then I give them big, the big lipstick kisses so that they wear their lipstick kisses on their heads. And um, I have, uh, then I leave. And then I've, I have a live-in dog au pair um, but and have had an arrangement like that since 1989. So I've had lots of I've had lots of them. Um, but I also employ a dog walker, and all my neighbors talk about how they they can kind of tell what's going on by seeing the lipstick kisses on my dogs because it's like a palette, or you know, like a blank a blank canvas. If you have a white dog, <laughs> no, I'm sure it's beautiful. So are 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 your dogs purebred or are they rescues? Well, they're rescues, but they're purebred. Okay. It, it's interesting in the golden retrieval world, most of the, uh, a great deal of the rescues are not purebred. They're just, you know, predominantly golden. Um, so I was just interested um, to know about the difference. Uh, so I'm always curious, are, are we anthropomorphizing these dogs or are they really our friends? I think I anthropomorphize, but on the other hand, I see these personality traits in my dogs and um, they become very conversational. I mean, they make themselves very, very clearly understandable in terms of what they want and their demands and their, their what they like and dislike. And even if when I rescue them initially, they're, they're kind of closed up and they aren't as expressive as they become pretty soon they kind of unfold and and um uh and start making it very clear what their personalities are like and i don't know i think that maybe you i'm, I'm sure if you are a, a big dog lover you probably agree with me but um i think dogs um have as much personality and as much feeling and as much uh, and and moods just the way people do. And I don't think that's anthropomorphizing. I, I observe that by watching them in action. It's interesting. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I definitely agree with you about that. But it, it's a very interesting. Have you ever had a cat? Um, I'm allergic to cats. Uh, they make me itch and they make me wheeze. So I have not had a cat. Interesting. So you have to, usually have two dogs. Um, you think your dogs are, would be lonely if they were alone? It was only I don't, one. It depends on the dog. Um, uh, right now, I have one dog, Girly, um, right. and I've only had her for a few weeks. And um, I must say that um, she doesn't seem to be lonely. Um, Minnie was lonely without Goose, but then again, I had Goose before I had Minnie. Goose did not seem lonely without Minnie, but he was a lot happier having Minnie around. And of course, Minnie was so happy to have Harry around. I mean, she she and Harry loved each other. I think Harry wait, was waiting all his life to, to find Minnie because all the behavioral problems that Carol had with with Harry went away when he met yeah. when, when he when he met Minnie. It's 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 as if she cured him and he adjusted very, very well. And when I was able to take him off all the medications, the behavioral medications he was on for sort of OCD, um, obsessive compulsive behavior and that sort of thing. I went to the vet and I said, why do you think he's, he's cured of these things? And he said to me, Minnie. And it, it, it somehow Minnie had a calming influence on him or was good at bossing him around. <laughs> there, there could have been some of that. Hey, no, interesting. So, so I, I saw this as a story about friendship. I think the love and friendship between the dogs and the people and each other, but about the beautiful friendship that you developed with Carol Furnick. So will you tell us a little bit about Carol? Carol was a singular person, larger than life, very colorful. She was a designer of many things. Uh, she designed clothing. She had um, clothing lines in Bergdorf Goodman and Henri Bendel, um, two fancy specialty stores in New York City. Uh, she has uh, 
there are clothes that she designed in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. She um, either did brand strategy or actual designing or both for like a who's who of, of, of fashion designers in, in, in this country. I mean, picture a, a magazine like Vogue or Vanity Fair and you think of, you see all those, those ads that you have to page through um, 30, 40 pages of those before you get to the table of contents. Michael Kors, Calvin Klein, all that. Kind. That's who she designed for or did brand strategy for. She designed for Harry Winston. Um, she designed uh, for, uh, not, uh, she designed furniture and home accessories and stationery and you name it. And she had a spectacular eye and she just had, um, an artistic personality in every way. She was very well read, she was very funny, but she saw everything in a way that was uh, informed by her eye, if you will. And um, she dressed in a singular way. She was probably six, six feet tall or close to it. And she had short gray ringlets and wore huge black glasses. And uh, anything that she wore, whether it was leather wrapped around her wrist as a bracelet or whether it was um, uh, something she designed and, and put together with articles of clothing that you wouldn't normally expect to put together. She looked sensational. Uh, she, she was not pretty, but she was striking. And if I tried to put together the kinds of things that she did, I would look horrible, but she just had the ability to use herself as a kind of a, an artistic canvas. And um, I describe in the book one time when we were going around the corner to um, the next street where we were um, invited to tea uh, by uh, a friend of Carol's and Stephen's um, who was helping us out because Carol and I were trying to leave the dogs at home and then observe them with a doggy cam while we were out. And so we'd been invited to tea and it was on the next block. And walking around the block with Carol, it was all these people looking at her and staring at her. Um, and she, it was like walking around the block with Big Bird. Um, because she had that sort, she was very tall, and I'm not so tall, and and just this this flamboyance that she had. It real all the, the closest thing I could think of was walking around the block with Big Bird. <laughs> so you developed this deep, close um, friendship very, very quickly at the end of her life. I'm curious. You you've traveled the world and been stationed from South Africa to London to Atlanta, New York, and whatever else. Um, is making are developing friendships different when you're a journalist or a diplomat, somebody who's always on the move? Um, and what is that like as compared to the friendship you've developed with Carol? I think it is very different um, because. You're here today and gone tomorrow when you cover stories. Uh, and um, even if the people that you meet um, are people that you might want to make friends with, in many situations, it's not appropriate. Your job as a journalist is to remain at arm's length in most situations. Working for CBS Sunday Morning is a little different because most of the stories we do or a lot of the stories we do are feature stories. And it's the first time in my career uh, working for Sunday Morning that um, I could actually feel that I was not violating journalistic principles or conflict of interest um, regulations by from time to time making friends with the people that I do stories about. And um, the other part of it is that when you get transferred every th few years and you're on the road 40% of the time as I have been and even more when I was overseas, um, it becomes harder to do the work of being a friend, to make friends uh, because you can't in a sense service the friendship you can't do the things that, that are necessary to maintain friendships. You have to rely on the close friends that you've developed over time who put up 
with your comings and goings. And it's, um, I, I've always been terribly, terribly grateful for the friends that I have because they do put up with, oh, I'm sorry, I have to cancel dinner, I have to get on a plane. Or wait a minute, I'm in another country suddenly. And, um, and the, there are people who are tolerate that. With Carol, um, the one thing about me and making friends is that I like who I like and that's that. Um, I don't, um, you know, I sort of get an instinct for people I like very quickly. And as soon as uh, Carol came over to my apartment for the first time with Harry, I knew instantly that she was someone that I would like to be friends with and um, that I wished that I had known for 25 years because she was fascinating and fun and and even though she was dying, she was fascinating and fun. And um, she was, I guess, the same way because we both realized that, that there was something there in the way of the, the not just a transaction about a dog. Um, and there was the added pressure in a sense of time running out. We didn't have time to waste. Uh, but again, it was more than that because um, it could have been just let's work out how to have this thing happen with the dogs. But this dog of hers was the most precious thing in her whole life. And I think it would have been very difficult if we hadn't liked each other because then she would have felt strange about bequeathing this animal to someone she didn't like or didn't know whether she'd like. But the fact that we both um, enjoyed our each other's company and saw the 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 the, the, uh, the value of friendship and saw that it, it was worth pursuing, even though it was a matter of months instead of years and years and years. So I, I was also struck by by the sort of practical, I guess I would say almost news parts of the book which was um, learning a little bit more about the 9-11 um, the Survivors Fund and Victims' Compensation Fund and Carol's uh, relationship to what it took to get something out of the fund. Well, first of all, Carol lived, when 9-11 happened, she lived at 55 Hudson Street, which is in downtown uh, Manhattan. And it's not exactly next to Ground Zero, but it's within a block or so of Ground Zero. And from the roof of that building, you could look right down into where, where Ground Zero was. And she um, lived in the toxic haze that surrounded that part of Manhattan for months. Uh, I think, I can't remember the exact number of days that the fires burned, but it was like 156 days or something like that. I, I don't hold me to the exact number, but it was around 156 days. And the air quality was really toxic and, and miserable all the time. And um, the doctors felt that Carol's liver cancer that killed her was the result of living next to ground zero. Um, it took 15 years to manifest itself, but like so many other people, um, she was able to apply for compensation through the victims, the 9-11 Victims Compensation Fund, but the process is long and involved. And she, she found a lawyer and the lawyer, started in, you know, put in motion the process of having her apply, but um, there were all kinds of, of interviews that had to take place and forms to fill out and hurdles to leap over and so on and so forth. And it was very, very difficult for her uh, because uh, she was diagnosed in May and she died in December. <laughs> and so all of that had to happen in that time. And of course, she got very quickly to the point where she couldn't work. And therefore she had no money. And um, she was desperate to try to um, qualify for the compensation because um, she had to pay her bills, she had to pay her rent. And um, uh, in the end, money came through, some of it came through just before she died and the rest of it actually came through after she died. 
Interesting. I was also very struck by the, by the hospice care and by her and her being at, at Haven at, at Bellevue and and the the sort of sadness I felt of somebody who is an independent worker or a freelancer and what kind of medical care they have available um, at the end of life. Well, in her case, it was very good. Um, the it, it was the craziness was that um, she fell um, and went to NYU Langone Hospital, and they said, "Well, you can't stay here because you're not going to be treated." She she broke bones in her back, and her 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 bones were very brittle because she had had radiation. Um, she had a tumor. Her liver cancer metastasized to a tumor on her spine, and they they used radiation to shrink it and so on, and that caused problems with her bones. And she fell and broke bones in her back. And because she um, was not going to have surgery, they said, "Well, you can't stay here." And so they moved her temporarily to the Haven, which was I don't believe it's there anymore. It was a a, a hospice within Bellevue Hospital. And the only reason she was finally able to stay there is because um, at, at a certain point, she couldn't take medication on her own um, without throwing it up and so on and so forth. And that meant that because she was no longer capable of living in any way on her own or, or being cared for at home, she was able to stay. But when she was there, she got very good care. And um, uh, it, it, it was, um, very humane and very professional and the nurses were wonderful and um she um i think uh, appreciated that she had a room of her own which was good and that there are a lot of situations where people don't and um, i've seen nursing homes that are horrible but um she was treated very well but the but the toing and froing between NYU and the Haven and whether she right. could stay. And I, it was just like a catch-22 nightmare. That's, that's what it felt like. You wrote it beautifully. Well, so I think people always want to know, who, who did you want to be when you were in fourth grade? Did you always know you wanted to be a journalist? I always wanted to, knew, to write. And um, uh, I lived in the country. Um, I had no playmates because I was an only child and we lived miles and miles and miles from school. And so um, I was always observing and writing and my father let me use his typewriter and I would write little newspapers and stories. And, and um, I was very interested in, um, in newspapers and journalism, even as a small child. And my family, we got a television, um, I, I think it was around 1956. Uh, my parents wanted to see the Army McCarthy hearings and they wanted to see the uh, political conventions. <clears throat> and we had to wait till there was a television station and we had a 30 foot antenna um, on the hill above our house in order to see anything other than black and white snow. And um, my parents watched the political conventions uh, and I sat cross-legged in front of the TV and I had a huge crush on Chet Huntley. And um, my parents and all my relatives said, well, uh, you know, she, she's bound to become a journalist because she has a crush on Chet Huntley. <laughs> Wonderful. So I, I just want to get two quick questions in before we, we let everybody um, add theirs. Uh, and one of them is, wh what's your process for writing? So this is your first book. Were you disciplined about when you wrote, how you wrote, where you wrote? Sure. Yes, be because I didn't have a lot of time. I, my Sunday morning job is five to seven days a week all the time. And um, uh, so I had to be very disciplined, especially having sold the book and having a deadline. And so um, whatever weekend time I had, usually Sunday afternoons, I would sit at my dining table with my laptop and work on it. And I would immerse myself in it um, from about noon till about six o'clock at night. And then during vacations and, you know, anytime I had days off, I would just immerse myself in it. I had no trouble disciplining myself whatsoever because I've been doing that my whole life on the one hand. But the, the big thing was that I wrote the book because I didn't want the story to end. Uh, yes, I really wanted to create a legacy for Carol 
for Harry, and then ultimately now because Minnie is dead for Minnie as well. Um, it, but I didn't want all those special moments and the intensity and the and the 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 story itself and even the New York parts of it, the color of New York. I didn't want the story to end. I didn't want it to be over. So every Sunday when I immersed myself and got to the concentration level that I needed um, in order to write and to create to create the words, I, I had to replay the pictures. It was like the movie in my head of the whole story each week in little chunks um, as I was working my way through the writing and it enabled it to go on. It was, um, uh, it was reliving it and, and I loved that process and I had no trouble. What I had trouble do is grabbing and uh, doing is grabbing enough time to, to, to work because I have so little time off. That, that, I love that. When did you know you it was going to be a book? At what point in your relationship with Carol um, did you decide this was what you wanted to write? Well, the first thing that happened is that I realized that this was very special because of the serendipity that brought it about, because of the the meeting Carol and the 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 uh, the friendships not only with Carol but the circle around her. After the very first meeting. When Carol came over with Harry, um, Stephen brought Carol and Harry over in his car, and we sat on, introduced the dogs on the stoop, and um, uh, after that get together, I came inside after they left, and I started writing diaries um, because I didn't want to forget anything. It seemed special even then, and. Every time Carol and, and Harry came over with Stephen and so on, no matter what the circumstances, I wrote diaries. And about two months in, I realized that this was a story that to me was very special, but it had an arc, a beginning, a middle, and it would definitely have an end. Um, but again, I thought about the legacy and um, I went to Carol and I said, I won't do, it occurred to me at that point, it was a book, maybe. And having never written a book before, I, I you know, this was all guessing. Um, I had no idea whether anybody would publish it. Uh, I went to Carol and I said, how would you feel if I tried to turn this into a book? I know it, I won't do it if you say no, because this is your life. This is your dog. This is your death. And if that's something you prefer to keep private, I won't do it. But if, if you did agree and it did get published, it, would, it really would provide you and Harry with a kind of a legacy. And she thought about it and she, I was at her apartment at the time and she kind of looked down and got very quiet. And then she looked up and she said, in a very, you know, almost whispering, she said, I would be honored. And I, it was just <sighs> for me, and um, so then I became even more conscientious about writing the diaries um, because again, you forget very quickly, um, you need the detail. And I couldn't have written the book without having written those diaries. And when I was talking to Carol after she said yes, she said, you think there could be pictures? And of course, again, I had no clue um, whether anybody would publish it. And I said, oh, I don't see why not. <laughs> And, and she said, one of the pictures has to be my idea wall, which was this collage right. of photographs and magazine clippings and, and so on that she, uh, of things that interested her or inspired her that she, she put on, uh, at, at that point, it wasn't a wall, it was on the doors of a great big cupboard that she had, pictures of Diana Vreeland, pictures of beautiful works of art, pictures of clothing, pictures of herself, her friends, all kinds of, anything that struck her fancy. And um, she really liked her idea wall. And, and I said, well, I, I don't see why not. And I, I believe it's in the book. <laughs> Wonderful. Tony, I know we've got, I've got a bunch more questions, but do you have any questions? Yeah, for and, we'll, and people can write their questions in the uh, question and answer uh, section of the, uh, of the Zoom. But I've got a couple of questions first. Um, getting Harry and Minnie together 
wasn't a done deal from the start. I mean, it, I was taken with what you and Carol went through to make sure, you know, you two may like each other, but making sure that, um, that uh, Harry liked you and uh, liked many and that the, that was a complicated process. It was quite a courtship. Um, the, the, um, uh, if, you, if you do it wrong, you can end up with two dogs who hate each other. That can happen anyway, which is what happened after Harry died. I tried, I adopted another dog and Minnie hated him no matter how hard I tried. But, um, you know, you have to do it so that they get used to each other gradually and that there isn't anything territorial going on that could cause fights. And uh, bull terriers are strong dogs. They could kill each other. And uh, uh, it, it is something that you want to make you want to have it go well. And so we had all these stages where we, we first we met on the stoop outside, neutral territory. The second time uh, Harry came inside and this was Minnie's territory for the first time. And there was tension, but then they re it was okay af after a while. And then each step along the way, we, leaving them alone uh, or leaving Harry here with me and with Minnie, and then eventually leaving both dogs alone, there was a whole drama over a doggy cam so that we could observe them while we, we were gone um, to see whether or not they killed each other. And th that ended up being a very silly kind of experience, but um, uh, you have to do it that way because otherwise um, it might not work. And um, Harry was also fairly expensive because he had all these medications and all these issues and so on. And, and I had to consider taking him on at the expensive part of his life and knowing that I would be the one who would ultimately have to decide to, to have him put to sleep and so on and so forth when he got old and ill and older and ill and so on and so forth. And that's, that's a lot of responsibility to take on and you have to know that it's gonna work and that, it, that, that, uh, that it's the right thing to do. Did, did you that, and Carol talk about when is the point, if, if this relationship works between Harry and Minnie, at what point you take him? Yes, uh, the very first time Carol came over, she said to me, well, I wanna keep him till, his, till the very end. I wanna keep him as long as I can. And I had expected to have her say, okay, we'll go through the whatever steps we needed to go through to socialize the dogs and then I would just have him. But she, for her, letting go of Harry was letting go of life. And um, it very quickly became clear to me why she felt that, um, that she wanted to keep him till, uh, till she couldn't take care of him anymore. Because it was, it, he meant everything to her and, and he really did symbolize life to her. And um, so in the end, when I did get him, um, he had been, he, he was, he had been coming for, for sleepovers. That was the sort of the pinnacle of the, the, the courtship was sleepovers. And um, so at one point after a sleepover, I suddenly got a call from, from Stephen saying, Carol isn't feeling too well. Could you take Harry for a few days? I'll, we'll, I'll take him home over the weekend. This was on a Wednesday. And so rush, rush, rush. Harry came over and we had to struggle to find his medication because Carol hadn't filled a prescription and so it was a mess and so on. And just when he got settled and it was gonna be time for him to go home, I got a call from Steven saying, Carol wants you to have him now, just keep him. And okay. And both Steven and I said to, him, to Carol after that, uh, we can bring him over. You can have all the benefits of having him with you without any of the work. He can come and spend time with you and she said, no, it would break my heart. And it, it, so I sent photographs every single day of the dogs together. And, and does Gurley have as good an, a wardrobe as Harry did? 
well, she's inherited all these things from Minnie. You know, she's small, so um, she, uh, Harry's clothes are too big for her, way too big, because Harry weighs, weighed about 60-something pounds and, and Gurley weighs 40 pounds. And so she has, um, she has inherited a, n very nice things from Minnie, because Minnie, of course, thought she was a glamorous movie star or a princess and wore jewels. Um, Gurley isn't into the jewels, but she is into, she really likes to wear her jackets and sweaters, believe it or not. I think she gets cold easily. You know, the thing, one of the things that I really enjoyed about the book is this is not just a story of dogs. This was a lot of story of Martha Teichner. Not only did we follow you on the walks to the the market, but we learned about your, your childhood in Michigan and even going back your interest in conservation and, and those sorts of things. It's, it is really a, a memoir of you as well. Well, as I said, it, it's my story. It's my life. And in a sense, that to me was what I could write about um, because of all the real, everything that happened with, with, Harry and Minnie and Carol had it ricocheted around my head and, and I had, um, there were echoes of other parts of my life. Um, and again, it was my personal story. Um, it's different from covering people you don't know in, in another country. Now tell people so, a little bit about, about Michigan. Yeah, and I'm just gonna ask them. Yeah. And the walking to the beach. Please. Well, um, I grew up in Northern Michigan. Um, and as anyone in Michigan, know, you know, you use your hand and you figure out, um, I'm trying to figure out with Zoom whether it looks backwards or not. But um, anyway, if you hold your left hand out in front of you um, like this, you, you have a map of Michigan. And um, I'm from right up the, the base of the little finger. Um, I was born in Traverse City and lived in Leelanau County, which is the next county over, which is much of the, the Leelanau County is a lot of the Little Finger and the area around it. And uh, we lived on a lake uh, with a, surrounded by woods. And um, as I said, I was an only child, so I didn't have playmates. So I spent a lot of time observing nature and the, the unusual people who lived around us and so on and so forth. And um, after my father died when I was nine, uh, we had to sell the, the property and move away because my mother had to make a living. Um, my parents had a business that was related to, to the fact that my father was a professional skier and his being a skier was part of the business, the, the front of the business, and my mother ran the business part of the business. She was not a skier. So as soon as he died, that was the end of that because you needed my father to have the business. Uh, and uh, so we moved away and the land was sold, the 40 acres and the house. And living in that particular area in that house in the woods along the lake was magical and my parents adored it and and it was just a truly special childhood until my father died and um i always dreamed about buying the land back or going back and so on and so forth. And um, I inherited the 20 acres next to where we lived because my grandmother had bought it, hoping to come up and live next to us in an old farmhouse on the, on the 20 acres that she bought, but she died before that happened. And, and I gave those 20 acres to the Leelanau Conservancy because um, the house fell in and I had to have it torn down and the rest of it torn down and removed and the well filled in. So um, I gave it to the Leelanau Conservancy and it became the core of something called the Teichner Preserve in honor of my parents. And a number of years later, um, I happened to be up in Northern Michigan visiting friends from South Carolina who have a place outside of Traverse City and they wanted to see where I came from and um, the house I grew up in. And so we made an expedition to where I lived and through a number of 
again, uh, chance encounters and, and serendipity, uh, we stopped to go shopping and we did a little of this and a little of that. And we finally made our way to the house. And my friends pulled in the driveway and there was a, a woman sitting in a chair on the lawn and we got out and the woman looked and she looked at me and she threw her arms open and said, I've been waiting all these years for you to come. And um, her name is Jana Blakely and she and her husband, Eric, had lived in the house I grew up in for many, many years. All the land around it that we had owned, the 40 acres had been sold off except for the one acre. And they hadn't sold it off. It had been sold off by other owners along the way. And we walked down to the beach um, in, through the woods and um, I expressed my, my wish saying I had always wished to buy the land back and be there and so on. They said, well, about a year or so ago, there were 17 acres um, that were for sale. And uh, I don't know about now. So I said, don't mention my name make some inquiries if you would please and let me know what you find out. Well, it turned out that the land was owned by a speculator who had gotten through, I think devious means had gotten permission to fill in the wetlands and build spec uh, at least one spec house and to build a road through the wetlands and, and um, really destroy the, wood, the, the woods that existed between the road and the lake. And um, apparently all the people around the lake had tried to fight him, but he had gotten permission anyway through a loophole in Michigan law that says that if the De Department of Environmental Protection doesn't act on a request to fill in wetlands in three months, it's automatically approved. Even though it, how that got tabled for three months is beyond me because all the people around the lake had fought him. And it turns out that he was ready to bulldoze in two weeks and um, had already hired the, the, the crews to fill in the wetlands. And I walked in cold, um, again, one of these situations. If we hadn't arrived at the house at exactly when we did, Jana Blakely would not have been sitting in that chair. They only arrived home from church and visiting some people minutes before we arrived. If we had come the next day, which we had originally planned to do, and not on the Sunday, they wouldn't have been there. Jana and her husband would have been at work. So again, through one of these kismet situations, I walk into the situation that um, uh, involved this land and um, thought, well, I'm gonna figure out how to way to put a stop to this. And so I contacted the Leelanau Conservancy, which is a very active land conservancy in, in Leelanau County. Um, one of the most active in the country. And um, together we worked to intervene. And um, the Conservancy, uh, I said, listen, I will, I will buy the land. I'll refinance my apartment in New York and buy the land. And they negotiated with the guy and convinced him that um, he would get his money out better and that he would look like a good guy if he sold to the conservancy rather than borrowed money to build a spec house that maybe wouldn't sell and so on. And it turned out that he um, wanted a whole lot more money than he had before and so on. And um, so the conservancy, in order to speed things up, bought the land and then I refinanced my apartment and paid for half of it. And it was $200,000, which seems like a lot of money, but I figured it was worth it. And so it extended the Teichner Preserve and a woman who owned a seven acre wedge in the middle, who did not believe we would be able to pull this off said, well, if you do, I'll give my land too. So she threw in her seven acres. And so now it's, um, 37 acres or something like that is the Teichner Preserve and people can go there and they took out the road, a gravel road that had been built from the road to the lake. And um, uh, they, they took out 300 and something dump trucks full of gravel in order to um, remove the road. And so the water is flowing and the 
life is coming back where um, it had been destroyed by the interruption of the flow of the water. And again, it was one of these chance encounters um, that, that enabled me to do something that, that I, I, I truly believe that in my life, if there's one thing more than anything else that I could say, this is the one good thing I've done, it's saving that land or helping to save that land. Well, one of the other good things you've done that I know some of us Southerners know is are your in conversations at Spoleto, right? right. I, I have some friends in Charleston, especially, who are, are great fans. So is Spoleto going to happen this year? And yes, it is. Um, it's going to be a kind of a hybrid festival. There are going to be um, in-person events, mainly outdoors or very social distanced, um, or there are going to be online things. I'm going to be doing three conversations instead of four because one of the events I was supposed to do is postponed for another year, the opera Omar, which was commissioned by the festival um, to be written by the, the uh, musician Rhiannon Giddens um, and another person. That's going to be postponed till next year. But um, for example, one of my conversations is going to be with a guy called Scott Sylvan, who is an illusionist who still can do his whole illusion show from Scotland virtually. Oh, great. And I, I've, I've seen it and they're doing it that way in Charleston. Um, and uh, but there are going to be live events. Chamber music is going to take place, but it's going to be social distanced at something like 25 percent. They're building an outdoor theater at the Charleston Visitor Center to do the play outdoors. And uh, so they're, they're struggling because the, the rules keep changing and they've had to deal with a lot of issues because of travel, because of visas to the United States on the part of performers who, who, uh, and crew members and tech, technicians who would come from other countries. So as we get close to the end, I don't see any, I think everybody's so busy listening that they're not asking questions, but if anybody has a question, please put it in the chat. Um, what's the one thing or the two things from this year of COVID that you want to hold on to and preserve when everybody's, well, when many of us have been vaccinated and move ahead? Um or anything. That's hard because the shadow over COVID for me has been um, losing two dogs in less than two months. I lost Minnie on November 9th and I lost her, um, Harry's successor, the dog that Minnie hated, Slinky. I lost him on New Year's Day. And um, uh, the shadow of, uh, over COVID was knowing that Minnie was losing ground and failing and fading and so on. And I knew I would lose her during COVID. So that was very sad for me. Um, and somehow the book and everything, you know, with that going on, the book and everything were like a long ago and far away time when New York was colorful and where when things like the events and the book could actually happen, which during COVID they couldn't. But the part I have liked or that, that meant something to me is that all those months at home, I was able to spend with Minnie um, instead of being on the road 40% of the time and working round the clock at the office. Um, I was able to be in the same room with her. I was able to be able to go and sit with her every little bit and spend time with her in the last months of her life. And the other thing that, that, that I would like to keep with me is, is the appreciation. It, it, there were sad parts of, of that time for me. But I, I really have um, a, a huge appreciation of how fortunate I've been. I have a home, I have a job, I have a back garden so I can go outside and I could look at the sky and I could um, feed the birds. And um, there would be something very contemplative about going out in the morning and, and um, at that point throwing tennis balls for Slinky, hundreds of them be, to get him tired out because of his, various anxiety disorder issues, but feeding the birds and watching the light change on the buildings and uh, in a sense, 
um, feeling the poetry in my head of the, the, the aspects of the natural world that I could actually see around me um, from my apartment in New York, um, enjoying going out at seven o'clock at night and banging on things and seeing all my neighbors. And yes, it was a way to say thank you to uh, the frontline health workers, but more than anything else, it was a way to see each other and to, to recognize community. So does New York feel like it's coming back to New York again? It's felt that way for a long time. And in the summer, when they started having the outdoor dining, it became a very festive addition to city life. A lot of city life had been shut down for the first few months, um, March, April. Um, it was like a ghost town. But it, it picked up in the summer months. And there were whole streets with colorful umbrellas and, and um, little strings of lights and buskers going and standing at the edge of these outdoor dining locations and singing and people getting up and dancing in the streets. And, and that part of it, it, it compensated for um, the things that weren't happening in so many ways. And you felt good about going out and eating outdoors because you were helping to keep restaurants in business. And, you, and restaurants are such a big part of New York life. And, uh, and I enjoyed that a lot. And I felt safe doing it because people were outside. And, um, and I'm glad that that's continuing because um, it, it really added a kind of a, a whole a whole dimension to New York that, that it, it's benefited from in so many ways because it is festive and it is fun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, just, I, I also have to add that, that I, I feel good about all the rescue animals who have found homes. And I know everybody worries that people are gonna give some of those dogs back, but I, I don't think really, I mean, you see how attached the number of families that I, I've seen in my neighborhood where you know there is a new member of their household and they never thought they would be able to handle a dog because both parents worked um that you know the shelters are emptier they're not well, empty one reason they're them. emptier is because they're 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 putting the animals in foster homes as much as possible because they've had to limit the numbers of people who can actually be working in the shelters um but i think what's happened is that the, that that the rescues have been going to different sorts of people from the people who rescued animals in the past. And they're discovering the joy of that neighbors down the street from me um, that's happened and they never had a dog before. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's just um, um, their joy at having, having a dog. It's just amazing. And I think that there's a lot of that. Uh, what? One of our uh, listeners wants to know whether you have plans for a next book. People keep asking me that, and, and I hope so, but it has to occur to me what that book is going to be. And, and, you know, with, with When Harry Met Minnie, it was so clearly a story with a clear story arc. And um, uh, that is, you know, I have to find something that, that will work like that. I mean, in a way, there's a prequel. Um, I did a lot of writing about um, the very first bull terrier I had, whose name was Piggy. And I got him in South Africa and he lived on three continents and he had a very, very interesting biography. And while When Harry Met Minnie is very much about um, community and friendship, um, in a way, if I ever get around to writing about Piggy, um, uh, the, the episodes of, of the three different episodes of his life, the writing I've already done about it, it's much more about um, exploring the whole nature of what is home. Um, because, you know, when you get transferred a lot, um, you have to come to terms with what is home and what's not home. And how do, how do you figure out what home is? Is home where you have a dog? Is home where you have your stuff? Is, is home where you cook? Um, is home where funny little details of your, your, your life um, unfold before you um, that define the place? And so I might do that. I don't know. I, 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 I um, 
I'm hoping that I can, um, you know, kind of once the pandemic ends um, to the point where people's lives are relatively normal and I can travel for fun again in a, in a meaningful way, I'd like to take a few months off before I kind of dig in and do the discipline again, because it means seven days a week um, in order to get something actually written. And it has to be a good enough story to, to subject myself to that amount of time again oh. it was two more than two years writing this book didn't piggy have to get um quarantined he did he um spent six months in quarantine um at a um uh quarantine kennel in kent um that was very nice it was much better than the one at, that it's a, sort of a huge one at he that was at heathrow airport where it was sort of like um battery chickens or something and dogs died there and cats died there and but this place was quite nice the people um did so well having a quarantine kennel with a guaranteed income from it that um while piggy was there they bought themselves a country house hotel for people on what they made with the quarantine kennel <laughs> i'm not joking you must be a wonderful dog owner if P piggy forgave you for quarantine he did okay. He because they liked him there. They they had extra large runs, and they'd go in and play with the dogs every day. And and um, they particularly liked Piggy, and so um, they would be able to go in and play with him. And then I could go visit him from time to time. But um, the owners really liked the animals, and they particularly liked him. And it gave me a chance to find a place to live, so that by I, I sent him on um, before I left South Africa. And which meant that the moving process was smoother and I didn't have to worry about him running away or something like that. And by the time um, he got out of quarantine, I had found a place to live and all my stuff had been moved in and, and I had found somebody to live in to take care of him, which was kind of hard because nobody had ever heard of a dog au pair before. And how do you convince somebody to come and work for you as a dog au pair if they can't see the dog because the dog's still in quarantine? You have, to, there's a leap of faith there. And, but it all worked out by the time he got out of quarantine, it was all set. And so he came home, recognized all his favorite furniture, sniffed around and made himself at, at home in the new place. Wonderful. Well, this is this has been a, a delight for me. Uh, one one quick last story. Um, years ago, when Martha and I were covering the same story, and I forget what it was. There's always a a time where there's a waiting. You're waiting for something to happen, and we were in a holding room. And Martha said, "I just read this wonderful book. It's called West with the Night." and recommended it. So tonight I've got my own recommendation when when Harry met me and it's it is just it's it is touching. And if you enjoy Martha's reporting on CBS Sunday morning, which you have to, um, you you as I said earlier, you can hear her go through it. Acapella Books has copies of the book with uh, Martha's signature in it, uh, signed book plates. Uh, they're available to get, which I would encourage you to do. Martha Teichner, Gail Evans, thank you both very much for a wonderful evening. Thank you all. Thank you both. Thank you very much, Martha. It was just a beautiful book. I, well, I really you. loved reading it. I, I really, really appreciate um, your doing this and it's a pleasure meeting you. And Lovely it's great you. to see Tony after all these years. It's been a while. Martha, thank you. And thank you all. Good night. Night.